Hello, I'm Daniel Cunningham, your Texas plant guy and horticulturist at Rooted In, and my colleagues and I are thrilled to bring you a program titled Rooted In Gardening, just the basics where we are going to dig in to some great information, some tips and tricks, whether you're new to gardening in Texas or just new to gardening in general. Now, we also wanna take some time to thank our special sponsors, the folks at Water is Awesome, where they say, use it, enjoy it, and just don't waste it, which is some great tips as we transition into the summer months. Now, speaking of Water is Awesome, I might encourage you to open up another browser and just search the great resources that they have available on their website. If you search Water is Awesome, you'll find their website, waterisawesome.com, where you can go and click and see a variety of different information, uh, tips and tricks to help with your lawn, your landscape, and kind of help you transition into ways on how you can lower your water bill, um, different blog entries, uh, you know, samples of different commercials that you've probably already seen on TV, um, and just you know, busting different myths, some great information there. Well, the one I wanted to highlight especially is the weekly watering advice. And so if you click on that, you can actually go to two different platforms based on where you live in the Metroplex, and they will provide you weekly watering advice based on local weather station data. So if it's raining, it will send you a notification. You can sign up for email or text message, and they will tell you, hey, you don't need to water this week. We've got tons of rainfall. Your lawn is doing just fine. And, you know, then maybe when we want to run into a time where we're, we've gone seven to 10 days without seeing rainfall, they'll send you a message to tell you how much and when to water. So two great resources there that you're going to want to check out uh, from our sponsors again at Water is Awesome, which is a partnership between Tarrant Regional Water District, Dallas Water Utilities, and the folks at North Texas Municipal Water District. So some great resources for you to take advantage. Now, they also have a handout that we help develop with them that goes along with this class. And I know uh, there's a lot of information in this class today. And so you may want to take notes or screenshots if you need to, but also this gardening guide will pretty much just highlight with the cliff notes or the cheat notes uh, of everything that we'll talk about. And so you can also download that at water is awesome. And I would encourage you to go ahead and do that now uh, if you have time in another browser. Now, before we get started, I also wanted to talk about our website at rootedin.com where my Patrick, uh, my colleague Patrick Dickinson, who, who you'll hear about, uh, hear from uh, a little bit later on in the presentation, and I and my other colleagues um, have really developed some resources to help you be more successful in your landscape as well, whether you want to sign up for a class, hopefully in-person class here before too long, um, get expert advice from our horticulturists who have, you know, decades of experience in the industry, um, and just, you know, tips and tricks on to help you be more successful in your lawn, landscape, and vegetable garden. We like to say we're rooted in education, rooted in science, rooted in stewardship, water conservation, and community. But we also have some blog entries and some, some other gardening guides uh, that you may want to take advantage of. And you can read more about our team there and kind of what we do and, and what we're all about. Uh, we hope to see some familiar faces tuning in today. But for those of us that are kind of uh, new to what we do, again, you'll be hearing from Patrick a little bit later uh, in today's presentation. Now, we want to get started talking about some of the challenges to growing plants but I promise we're going to provide solutions on the how to overcome those challenges as well. Now, specifically, you know, those new to gardening in Texas, you may have been gardening in another, you know, state, perhaps it's somewhere where it's, it's cooler, perhaps uh, somewhere where it's warmer or an area that has better soil types. So we have some challenges, which you may have seen if, if you're kind of just getting started. In fact, uh, at last year, the latest study shows that we have over 20 million Americans new to gardening 
uh, in the United States. And that's a great number of folks. Maybe they're spending more time at home. Uh, maybe they're interested in growing food or flowers. But we know that getting out in the garden, not only is it good for our physical health, but also our mental health. And, and that's a great step to take uh, for anybody who's watching today. Now, speaking of the challenges to gardening in Texas, we have extreme weather. And if you were here in February, we probably experienced some of that extreme weather in our landscapes that may still be taking their toll. We've also seen some extreme weather here lately in the summer as we kind of transition into summer here um, in terms of extreme heat with temperatures, you know, 98 degrees or so. We've also had recently record rainfall. Um, and so we got, you know, a lot of rain at once. And then we've seen in the winter, we were in a drought. And so you've got kind of all this extreme heat, extreme, you know, freezing temperatures. We've got lots and lots of rain and then periods where we don't see so much rain. And, and that can be a challenge on a number of plants that we may have wanted to grow or were used to growing in a different climate. So we really want to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success, choosing the right plants in the right place. And, and Patrick will dig into that here in, in just a moment. And we also have poor soils that I alluded to, and I promise we'll dig into those a little bit more, but you know, there's challenges in terms of soils that are too alkaline or too clay and how that affects that rainfall that we've talked about. Uh, there's a number of weeds that are prominent here in North Central Texas, which tend to compete with our plants, not only for sunlight, but also water and nutrients. We'll talk about a few ways that we can counteract those weeds and really try and focus on growing those desirable plants. Pest insects can also be a challenge. We talk about that in a number of our classes, but we do wanna remember that 80% of insects are either beneficial or benign. So we like the practice of IPM or integrated pest management. We wanna first identify the insect and then make sure that we're choosing a method to control that that goes along with uh, the environmental needs uh, that we have in terms of our water resources. So we wanna make sure we're not applying things in an irresponsible way that could be detrimental to, to us and our families or our landscape plants, but also for the ecosystem around us. And then water is a growing issue. And, and there's a pun in there because water is the, the most limiting factor to growing plants. It's, it's the, the thing that plants need more importantly, not too much, not too little, but just the right amount. We'll talk about more on how to deliver that water, but it's also a growing problem because we live in one of the fastest growing areas, not only in the state, but in the country. And so we're gonna have to figure out how to do more with less water. One of those ways is by planting the right plant material and delivering water in the most efficient methods. And, and we'll touch on that. Now I wanted to kind of lay a foundation of understanding that environment a little bit deeper. We'll first start off with our macro environment, which is basically our, our environment as a whole, kind of looking at a larger scale. Now you may have heard the term in gardening hardiness zone. And basically this is the 30 year average of the lowest temperatures. The USDA has calculations at local weather stations. And not to say that this is as cold as it will get, it's just the 30 year average. We may see temperatures significantly less than this, depending on the year. Some years we may not see temperatures as cold as this, but this is our average. And in our area, zone 8A, we typically are going to see temperatures to the 10 degree to 15 degree Fahrenheit range. So that means the bulk of our plant material in our landscape should be cold hardy to at least that point if we want it to come back year after year after year. So many of our perennial flowers or shrubs or trees need to be cold hardy to at least 10 degrees. And we saw negative three, negative four, depending on where you are in the Metroplex this year. So you may wanna make sure that, that some of your plant material is even more cold hardy to a zone like 7B or 7A or 6B to cataract some of the temperatures we get in kind of these record brain and breaking outlier years. But what we do 100% want to make sure is that if we see plant material at the nursery, that's only cold hardy to zone 8B. You look at the plant tag and it says it's only cold hardy to 8B or 9A. Well, that means that probably we're going to see temperatures cooler than that. And that plant material is going to die back and 
we're not going to have that material come back year after year. So that's protecting your investment, making sure you're planting plants that are cold hardy to our area, or at least that should be the focus. Now, I mentioned our soil type. We are dominated in this area by poor draining clays that tend to be alkaline. If you're not familiar with that term alkaline, it's basically just the opposite of acidic or basic. Um, and that brings its own set of challenges in the, in the garden. And, and we'll talk about more of that as we kind of go forward. Uh, but that's what we're dealing with. We wanna make sure that if we are choosing plant material, that they're adapted to growing and poor draining clays and they can withstand, and withstand alkaline conditions because if they're acid loving plants or plants that need really well draining soil, you know, even if we amend those soils, those plants are gonna tend to struggle. Now, I would say you could have a few project plants, plants that you plant in pots and they need a little bit extra attention. Maybe you can bring them in in the winter. Maybe you can amend the soil a little bit easier in a container. But where we get into trouble is if you plant the majority of your landscape in those project plants, then you're gonna have a lot of work. And basically you probably are going to be creating a landscape that is gonna set yourself up for failure. So a few handful of project plants, okay, but we want to plant the majority of our landscape in native or adapted plants that can withstand all these extreme weather and, and, and you know, climate, soil, you know, rainfall, all that, uh, that, that, that can definitely be a challenge here in, in our area. Now, speaking of rainfall, we get about 36, 37 inches of rainfall in our region, it's a little bit drier as we move further east, it's our further west rather, you can see on the map, and then it's a little bit wetter as we move further east. And so um, plant material has kind of a set, uh, you know, amount of water that it thrives in, depending on, you know, how spaced out the rainfall events are. There are plants like cacti and yucca and agave that do better in drier climates and that do like well-draining soil. And so if we are trying to plant those, we wanna make sure that we plant those in areas where the water can drain because it's on a slope or because we've amended the soil. And we wanna make sure that we're planting those in areas that have plenty of sunlight and warmth. So we're mimicking those conditions where those plants are adapted to. Now, there are other plants that are probably better adapted further east, and so we want to make sure that those plants are going to be able to withstand those drought periods where we're not seeing significant rainfall, and then perhaps those plants, we're going to make sure that they're not getting too much sunlight, maybe on the west sun that tends to be more harsh. So we're basically just trying to plant plants that are adaptable to that rainfall regime, because anyway, one or the other, we're going to have to do a lot of extra work in, in terms of maintenance. So something to think about. Now, I mentioned drought in Texas, and that's just kind of part of the climate that we live in. We run through uh, periods of time where we're seeing less than 50% of our average rainfall, and that's all it means. We've gone to a period where we're seeing less than 50% of that average. Um, and for the past decade, we've seen um, some of the wettest years on record and some of the, the driest year on record. And that paired with our extreme heat really can create some challenges during the summer month. In fact, you may not know that we have an average of 20 days a year in our region where we see temperatures exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So if we have a drier summer and it's extremely hot, then the water in the soil evaporates and if we don't have a rainfall event to kind of return that water, then that's more critical for our plants. And that's when we're gonna to have to supplementally water in order to keep those plants alive. But we wanna make sure that we're not wasting water, we're not putting too much water because we can actually cause more problem with our plants that way. And so if we can plan now, even you know, in the past week, we've got significant amounts of water. We like to say in times of flood, plan for drought. In times of drought, plan for flood. And if you're designing aspects of your landscape to plan for the droughts, and, and we'll talk about some easy ways we can do that, whether that's incorporating compost or mulching using drip irrigation, then that's gonna set our plants up for success. And we can kind of smoothly transition through the summer until we get cooler temperatures again in the fall. 
Now, that's our macro environment, but I also want to talk a little bit about our micro environment. And that's really kind of at a smaller scale, a home scale, the different conditions that vary on maybe one side of the house or another, or with your irrigation system. Now, we are in the northern hemisphere, and so that we know that sun's always going to rise in the east and set in the west. But what you may not realize is the sun tends to sit on the southern horizon. So that's where we're going to get the majority of our sunlight unless we have big, large shade trees. So the eastern sun in the morning, it comes up and it's, that's typically going to be the coolest part of the day in our area. And so that sunlight is easier for many plants to handle. Now, once we get in the hottest part of the day, especially you know, if we're seeing 98 degree temperatures like we just recently saw, there's some plant material where that, that sunlight is a little bit too harsh. And so you may want to make sure that the orientation of where you plant the plant not only does is the quantity of sunlight right if a plant says hey it's part sun or part shade or full full sun full shade you're putting it in the right spot but knowing that the quality of sunlight is also an important role. So look at where the sun is coming in terms of buildings. Is it maybe a shed or home or a fence that's shading out part of an area? We see that a lot on the northern side of fences and buildings where uh, the sunlight just can't pass through because of the angle in the sun. Those tend to be the darkest area of the landscape. So if you're looking at your plant tag, kind of pay attention to you know, where the buildings and structures are and how much sunlight those areas are getting so you can match it with the right plant material. Now we already said it gets extremely hot here um, and it's, it's you know, pretty hot right now. Um, and as the heat from the sun kind of radiates off pavement and concrete and sidewalks and driveways, even bricks of our homes, that creates a little bit of a heat island effect. So that may be a great spot for those cacti and yucca, yucca and agave, those type of plants that we mentioned, um, but other plants that are, you know, maybe they don't like as much heat, those should be protected on an area away from, from those items that create that heat island effect. Now, irrigation system is also part of a micro environment. So you may have drip irrigation in one spot and overhead sprays in another spot, or you may have just an area that you have to hand water. And, and that irrigation system is actually just consisting of, you know, your hand and a hose and, you know, some type of sprinkler. Well, you may be watering that area less frequently. And so you may want to put more drought tolerant plant material in an area that doesn't have an in-ground irrigation system. Or perhaps if you have an, an irrigation system like that, that is closer to your house, the plants that need a little bit more water, maybe you're putting those in pots nearby, you're, you're using automated you know, drip timers that you can set up to your faucet if you want to, but kind of think about that and know that some areas of your landscape get a little bit more water, some areas get a little bit less water, some areas the water tends to evaporate quicker, those areas in full sun, and so that affects how much you need to water each plant. Now, I mentioned categories of plant lighting a little bit earlier, but I wanted to just touch on that a little bit more. So if you are looking at a plant tag and it says, you know, this plant does great in full sun to part shade, well, what does that actually mean? And it is important to think that it maybe means something that if it's growing in the Northeast, but full sun in Texas may be a little bit too much for that plant. So we want to make sure that we put plants that are adapted to uh, the right amount of sunlight in the spot that is receiving that sunlight in your landscape. Full sun just means that plant has direct sunlight all day. Part sun means that two to three hours a day there's filtered light or it doesn't get direct sunlight. Um, a part shade area gets dappled light or maybe four to five hours with direct sun. It may be getting some light, sunlight through branches during that time. Full shade areas tend to, to not receive any direct sunlight on a plant, but they may seem bright because of reflective light. So a lot of times these areas have covered tree canopies, but maybe there's light reflecting on a house or 
a fence or something like that. And so it feels like it's bright underneath there, but they're not actually getting direct sunlight, maybe a little bit of sunlight through the trees. And then we have those truly dense shade areas where, where they're deep shade. And, and it's those are the spots where you're not getting any direct sunlight on the plant all day. These are really the most challenging spots, but we'll talk about some plants that will actually work in those areas. Now, another thing to think about is that sunlight is not, um, you know, st standard or static all throughout the growing season. The, the sunlight that a certain area of your landscape gets may actually change through the seasons, and that's because the orientation of the sun in our homes. And we mentioned that the west sun is hotter and the east sun tends to be more gentle and the south side of our house tends to get more sunlight. Um, but as the sun's position changes in the summer, it sits more overhead. In the spring and the fall, it's kind of lower in the southern sky. And then in the winter, it's even more low in the southern sky. So that angle changing actually affects how much sunlight or shade is in the area. Also, in the winter, when many of our deciduous plants lose their leaves, they let a little bit more sunlight in there. So kind of think about that too. Um, there is a, a tool that is interesting you may want to check out, and that is called Google Earth Pro. You can do a quick internet search on there. You type in your address, and it's got a little picture of a sun, and you can actually track the sun on your property, and you can see the amount of sunlight and shade kind of wane and and go back and forth depending on the season. So that'll help you see, hey, this area I thought maybe was a, a part shade area, but in actuality, it's probably more of a full shade area, or maybe you thought it was a part shade area and it's really more of a part sun area, but just something to kind of keep in mind to help you put the right plant in the right place. Now I talked about a lot of negative things, you know, all the different challenges that we, that we have here in our area, but what can you do? What can you do to overcome those challenges? Well, we like to create outdoor spaces and would encourage you to do the same that look great and can increase your home's value. You can reduce your municipal water use or the water that you're getting when you when you turn on the tap inside and, and especially outside the home where we tend to use more water in the landscape. We can help curb stormwater runoff and pollutants. In fact, a lot of the pollutants that end up in our local lakes where we get our drinking water from and the water for our landscape you know, they're actually coming from the landscapes themselves. If we're over applying or misapplying different pesticides or fertilizers. And so we wanna make sure that we're doing that per label instru instructions, applying those the right way. You also may want to grow some of your own food. So grow plants that actually provide food for people or perhaps pollinators and wildlife. One thing that's been really exciting for me as a gardener over the past decade is to plant for hummingbirds and butterflies and bees and the other critters that call North Texas home as well. Uh, not only is that better for our environment as a whole and the ecosystem services that the plants and animals provide, but it's also just physical en enjoyment. You can sit outside in your landscape and uh, you know, my daughter and, and wife get a kick out of seeing uh, the hummingbird, you know, come to the flame acanthus. And so I know that's something that, that Patrick and my other colleagues uh, get excited about as well. And I, and I hope you'll give that a shot. We teach classes that focus on that. Uh, and then we can do all this without breaking the, the bank. Um, there's certainly different ways that you can be more efficient with your water resources and your time and, you know, fertilizers where you can actually be saving money and get to spend more time enjoying your landscape. In fact, those are some of the trends that we've seen recently here in America. Every few years, the American Society of Landscape Architects asks their customers what they're actually looking for in a landscape design. Most folks are looking for landscapes that are more environmentally sustainable, that reduce water costs, that are lower maintenance. In fact, 88% of folks are interested in rainwater or gray water harvesting. 86% of folks are interested in native and adapted plants, which we'll talk about here in a minute. 77% are interested in pervious paving. If you're not familiar, these are hardscapes uh, like patios and pathways that are using materials that actually infiltrate water. So this could be decomposed granite or gravel, flagstone pathways or limestone uh, areas that have gaps in between where the water can infiltrate rather than traditional concrete, which tends to, to shunt the water away and can contribute to flooding problems when we get a lot of rain. 
75% of Americans are interested in edible landscaping, whether that's traditional vegetable garden or just mixing edible plants throughout the landscape. 73% are interested in rain gardens or depressions that will capture water when we're getting lots of it, and then we'll infiltrate that water during the periods where we don't see a rainfall. A lot of folks, 72% are interested in drip or efficient irrigation. Drip irrigation is 90% efficient. Patrick will talk about that, but 90% of the water would actually go into the root zone rather than being lost to evaporation on those hot, windy days. Definitely the best way to water many of our native and adapted perennials. And then 72% of Americans are interested in reducing their lawn area, not only for, um, you know, just being able to grow more beautiful plants and flowers, but it also reduces our maintenance needs and our water needs because uh, established perennials, the you know, it could be flowers, trees, shrubs, will use uh, less water and tend to be less maintenance than our traditional lawns. So, you know, that is the, the plant material that we still see in subdivisions, uh, whether they're newer or older, all over the Metroplex. If we did a bird's eye view, we would see that as the dominant species. In fact, it's the fourth largest crop in the country behind corn, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, lawn is the largest irrigated crop in the country. And so if we talk about water conservation or wanting to save water on our water bill, reducing the lawn area really makes sense. And so we would encourage some folks, maybe you don't want to get rid of the entirety of your lawn, but just a little and transition to native and adapted perennials so you can reduce your water bill and reduce uh, the maintenance needs. And then you can increase the time you spend in your landscape. Now, when we talk about native and adapted plants, unfortunately, so many people think we're talking about cacti and yucca and agave and rocks just, just dominating the landscape. And although, you know, certainly we love those plants and they have their role, really, um, that can create some challenges in terms of that heat island effect. We want to show people that we can plant water efficient, adapted plants that are lush and vibrant and have a variety of different colors and textures. And once these plants are established, they're pest resistant and disease resistant and, you know, don't need a lot of water during those droughts. And, you know, a lot of these plants serve dual purpose where they actually provide nectar sources for different butterflies and hummingbirds. And some of them are actually edible too, uh, like this Mexican plum, uh, which in addition to being an host species for butterfly and food for birds can also provide food for humans. Now, traditionally native and adapted plants are gonna use less water, less fertilizers, less pesticides, saving you time and money. What we would encourage folks to do is if you're planning a landscape design, whether that's starting over from scratch or trying to design your landscape to be more beautiful and, and more easygoing, less maintenance, you can reduce your turf grass area to about a third of the landscape. You can increase your beds with different colors and textures of plants to about a third of, of perennial plants, plants that are gonna come back year after year. And then to connect those different spaces, you may wanna use about a third of your landscape area in that hardscape I talked about. So this could be pathways and patios, sitting areas, uh, it could be borders for different plants, it could be a fountain, it could maybe be, you know, a little arroyo or a dry creek that runs through the landscape. These actually allow water to infiltrate when it is raining and incorporating those pervious surfaces. Um, and so then it sinks into the root zone and the plants can take advantage during those dry periods. So it's, it's kind of win-win using what we call the landscape rule of thirds. Now, I mentioned my, my colleague Patrick is going to join us next with some tips and tricks live in his own landscape where he'll talk about how he designs and some, some you know, different tips that you may want to pick up to make your landscape more beautiful. Patrick, take it away. All right, let's talk about my favorite subject, design and plant selection. Uh, this is my nerd out moment where I get to talk about all some of the great new plants, um, all the design principles that we cover. Um, it's, it can be a lot of fun, but I don't want it to be overwhelming for you. Um, I will tell you that a couple of the biggest mistakes people do in their designs 
is if they don't have a design for their garden. And that's where things kind of start looking chopped up and broken up. Give yourself a design, have a plan, whether you do it yourself or you have somebody do it for you. That way, as you do things in phases or in stages, you have some consistency. I have a lot of trucks going behind me, so you'll have to get, excuse some of the background noise. But make sure that you have some type of plan going forward. Um, the other thing that people tend to do wrong is thinking they have to have a huge variety of plants in their garden. And that's not for everybody. My front landscape is a very minimal planting. Um, I like the cleanliness and the simpli simplicity of the modern landscape in my front yard. Um, I have a mass planting of a Berkeley sedge um, and oxidized steel kind of levels the yard and I like that simpleness. Now my backyard, as you've probably seen in the background, I am, remember, a professional plant nerd. This is where I get to have fun. This is my, in fact, our rule in our backyard is only one of something. That gives us the most maximum space to really have fun um, and play along with these plants and have a lot of texture um, and color. And that right there is my two favorite design principles. I think most people, if they just get a lot of good contrasting texture in their landscaping and color in their landscaping, meaning contrasting working off of each other um, and not against each other, then you can be successful. Um, there's a lot of fun blooming plants. My backyard is pretty much almost 100%, uh, well, I'd say about 95% perennial, meaning that the plants all go dormant in the winter. And I'm okay with that, especially this year with the, with the winter that we had. But some of the contrast and uh, t uh, textures that you can do in your landscape, you can have a lot of fun with. Um, and I'll talk about that here briefly. The third design principle that you really need to do to keep kind of order and uh, uh, consistency and containment in your garden is lines. Providing yourself the edging and the borders um, and the walkways, things that give you structure in that landscape that makes sense of the landscape. Some people go out and they'll just start planting plants in their grass or as a border around a fence. And then they're like, I don't know what I did wrong. Well, create your bedding, give yourself that footprint first so you know your planting parameter and where you're gonna plant within. I got some good background music going on with the car going by. A lot of activity today um, on the road. So now some of the fun plants that we get to talk about. We are big cacti succulent people in my household. Um, we have quite a few agave and succulents and cacti, um, not all hardy either. So they stay in containers. And I, that's one of the things that I would recommend. If it's not zoned or hardy for this area, I would highly recommend that you keep it in a container so that you can protect it or have yourself a hobby greenhouse that things can be left in or moved into. Um, so many people learn this the hard way with this last uh, winter and the freeze. Um, so I'm getting my little girl over here is keeping me company still. Um, so um, it, make sure that you're zoning your plants uh, for the right area, but some of the great combinations. Behind me, you're seeing one of my favorite plants. Um, there are two of, I have two plants or species of plants that um, I really get excited about, and there's so many new varieties and colors out there. This is a uh, Rose of Sharon, as many of y'all know it, or Althea, which is a true hardy hibiscus. Um, all of these guys have been blooming like crazy after the freeze, um, and I have quite a few fun ones. Uh, this one right here is a, a pink satin, um, and when you get up close to the petals of the blooms, they have a satiny color to them. Um, really, really pretty. But in front of it, you'll see I have some silvery leaves of a compact Texas sage. Uh, this particular one is Desperado. Um, and it just got done blooming and it looks like it might bloom again. But you can see right here, the contrasting of the color of the foliage gives a definition. You can tell each plant individually. It's when people start mixing things that it kind of looks like a green blob. Um, you really want contrasting leaf shapes, contrasting leaf color, and contrasting blooms. Behind me over my left corner is a brand new addition to the garden. Um, and this is a dwarf purple smoke tree. And you can see in front of it, I've got some beautiful purple blooms. So I'm gonna get contrast. That's gonna act like a taller tree, kind of like the Althea is. Um, that was a spot that we lost a palm tree in the freeze and we decided to replace it with something we knew would be hardy. Now, some of my other favorite contrast um, in the garden, uh, this year for uh, 2021, the color of the year was silver and gray. 
Um, so this right here is a what's called New Look Dusty Miller um, or Cirrus Dusty Miller. And you can see that it has a much larger leaf um, on it than the other uh, Dusty Millers you're used to seeing. Um, and so I left it in the garden and surprisingly the yellow blooms that it's been blooming um, since winter time um, has been attracting a lot of pollinators in the garden as well. You can see it's turned into a nice mass behind, uh, around it. Right next to it to have that silver and purple, I have my dwarf phytex tree. Um, this one is blue puffball um, and it maxes out. It's mature right now at about three, three to four feet tall and wide. Now behind over here for more texture contrast, I have a variegated Rose of Sharon, Althea. Um, this one is called Sugar Tips um, and it gives a lot of contrasting. And then right next to the silver and blue, I have my Candy Corn Spirea. Um, this one you can see has a little bit of a lighter colored leaf. And then as the leaves come out, they come out this orange um, with pink and red in it. And it just got done blooming, so now would be the time for me to prune it. Now, coming up strong in the back, even after the freeze, and this particular grass will get to about six feet tall by six feet wide. This grass is called Princess Caroline Napier grass. Um, and you see that it's turning black. The more heat and sun that it gets, the darker color it gets. And I have it right next to my variegated Rosa Sharon with this nice purple bloom on it. Um, and so the contrast of these working off of each other is what I really appreciate in my garden. And then right behind all of these with that black, ooh, there's a bee on that one. Looky there. Can you see them? Can you see the bee? Oh, there it is. So this is a new butterfly bush. This is another one of my plants that I'm a little addicted to. Um, and this is the honeycomb butterfly bush, which is a yellow blooming. Most of our butterfly bushes, and I'll show you a couple other in just a second, have a lot of pinks and whites and purples in them. Uh, but this is one of the first um, yellow butterfly bushes that we have. But I've got that yellow working off of um, the black of the Princess uh, Napier grass. I have the candy corn spirea. I have the new look Dusty Miller um, in my garden. And I'm going to show you another couple of my favorite contrasts in the garden. Let me switch hands right here. So this right here is another hardy hibiscus that's coming up and it's the summerific series um, this bloom is huge we call them dinner plate type uh, blooms the leaves on these will also turn a purplish black color and look at the contrast up against that sunshine ligustrum this is another one of the color and texture contrasts that i was talking about when you have the chartreuse colors up against these deep rich colors and then you throw in the mix of the bloom look at all that contrast and texture in the garden now my backyard is a freeform garden um, if it requires pruning um, or regular care or maintenance it doesn't belong in my backyard garden it doesn't really belong in my garden at all so i jokingly call myself kind of the lazy landscaper as a whole because you can see back here Look at all these blooms. That's the free form. This is giant Rubecchia right here. I've got some bee balm Minarda blooming right next to me right here. I've got the beautiful purple coneflower in full bloom. Uh, you can see some of the others that are gonna start blooming in the background. My milkweeds have all bloomed out. I've had a full two cycles of uh, monarch butterflies. This Althea right here is called Strawberry Smoothie. Um, it has a pink, like a red, reddish inner cent, uh, center and then the white blooms. And the other white bloom that I showed you a minute ago, this one is Diana. This is a pure white um, uh, uh, Althea in the garden. Now butterfly bushes, there's many different types of butterfly bushes. The standards can get, like you see the honeycomb, that is the honeycomb right there. It can get, last year it was at the top of the fence, so about eight feet tall. Um, and it maxes out that space and I give it its elbow room. I let it do its thing. Um, but there's many different types of butterfly bushes. Some are dwarfs. Uh, some of the ones that we've been selling, like the white one is a uh, dwarf at two and a half feet. Uh, Tutti Frutti is a two and a half foot plant. Um, and then I have another one over here, and this one is called bicolored um, butterfly bush. And this one's a, a beautiful one. Um, it has multiple colors in the bloom. Um, and let me, maybe this is a better shot right there, but you can see it's got the pinks and the peaches and the very tips as they open up um, are more of a purple bloom. Um, and then showing you some more of the silver foliage that uh, we have in the garden. This is a silver Sierra mountain laurel. So many of y'all know the 
mountain laurels uh, that bloom that beautiful purple bloom and smells wonderful um, during the early springtime. This is a silver leafed one. So again, I'm, I'm working with that silver um, and the grays of the 2021 color. And just a couple of more to show you. Uh, this right here is lavender cotton or uh, Santalina. It has a nice little yellow bloom on it. It smells like kind of a, a licorice type, but look behind it. The whale's tongue agave and the contrast of that green and that silver and gray. And then when we flip the other side of the walkway, we've got the beautiful purple and then right behind it, the pink skull caps that are also right below that silver leaf um, uh, mountain laurel. So again, contrasting textures, contrasting colors. That's how you're going to be successful with this. Try not to get too attached to a lot of things that have the same shaped leaf or the same color leaf because those greens, that's when you start getting into that green blob in your landscape. Follow those basic three principles. Lines give you that definition and that structure, color contrasting, and texture contrasting, and you're gonna do great at this. And we are here from you moving forward. You can always reach out to us and we're here to help you to make sure that you're really successful at that. Thank you very much. Man, great information and what a beautiful landscape. Now, let's talk a little bit more about soil. And, and really, soil is the foundation, pun intended, of everything we do in the landscape. And really, great gardens begin with great soil. If we can encourage our soil health, then our gardens are going to be easier to care for. A lot of people call the stuff that we're digging in the garden dirt, but we want to kind of differentiate dirt versus soil. Dirt is undesirable kind of man-made materials that are, that are out of place. But soil is actually something quite different. Soil is naturally occurring. Um, there are materials and minerals that allow for the anchoring of plants where the roots of trees and shrubs and perennials can grow. There are also moisture storage for plants. So that's where the plants are actually getting the moisture is from the different particles in the soil and the water that is bonded to those particles. It's also nutrient storage for plants. So all the, the nutrients that plants are taking up, or the majority of them through the root zone are actually hanging out in the soil. And if they're available that way, then we can keep our plants healthy. I wanna talk a little bit about soil type. And really we categorize soil for the most part by what the size of the particles are. You, you've heard all these terms before, you may not realize what they actually stood for or meant. Sand are larger particles of soil, and uh, we would say that relatively compared to other forms of soil, they're like a beach ball. So we have these big particles, relatively big, that are two millimeters to 0.5 millimeters. And not only are they big, but they also have big pore spaces in between them. If you took a swimming pool and you put a bunch of beach balls in there, there would be a lot of gaps in between those beach balls. And that's area where kind of the water uh, moves through very quickly. It also dries very quickly. And so you have big gaps of, of airspace in between there. Silt has been weathered. So this is, uh, you know, these are minerals, rock minerals that have been broken down. Maybe they're a little bit flatter. They're still relatively, you know, large compared to, to some other particles. And they tend to kind of sit like Frisbees. If you put a swimming pool full of Frisbees, you would notice that there are plenty of pore spaces in between, um, but they, they maybe if you added some water to there, they would have to kind of percolate through. Uh, then we look at, at clays, and clays relatively are about the size of a dime. If you had imagined putting a swimming pool full of dimes, wait, well, hey, you know, I don't know why you do that. That's a lot of money. Um, but really, you know, there's not a lot of gaps in between. If you added water to there, that water would be pretty dense in between those pore spaces, and it would probably take a long time for the water to kind of percolate down there. And so there are different characteristics depending on you know, what part of the Metroplex you live in, or you may have come from an area where you were dealing with sandy soil, and now you, you probably have clays somewhere in your soil profile. And those characteristics affect what plants can grow in an area. In fact, most plants like or prefer a sandy loam. And so many times when you are gardening, you can buy bulk soil in the form of sandy loam, whether that's to you know, top dress before you put a lawn down, or maybe that's uh, to, to bring in and build your raised beds to put sandy loam. 
Um, but that can be expensive, cost prohibitive. And so for the most part, we want to kind of work with what we have. And there are ways that we can amend perhaps our clay soils or maybe our sandy soils in order to kind of uh, you know, set them up so they're, they're more successful to grow plants that you want to grow. Now, really, when we refer to soil texture, if we call you know, something a sandy loam or a silty clay or a, a sandy clay, it is that relationship between the amounts of those three different particles um, and how they're mixed together in the soil profile. Now, what you may have noticed is that we got a lot of rain in the past couple of weeks, but now in the past week, we haven't got so much rain. And, you know, maybe we, we will get a little bit of rain today, uh, depending on where you live, hopefully. Um, but when we think about that, our clay soils that have those very small particles, once they infiltrate water, which they don't like to do, you know, very quickly, then it tends to evaporate and leave these cracks. This is why we call them shrink and swell clays. They, they're really not good for the foundations at home, but they can also provide their own set of challenges with growing plants. And I wanted to show that a little bit, you know, and how soil reacts to, to different rainfall. Now you can imagine the sand like you see at a beach. When a wave crashes on the beach, it doesn't leave a puddle, right? It kind of just goes right through the sand. And that is because that sand has high permeability. The water can infiltrate just, just you know, very quickly, which brings its own set of challenges if you're trying to garden sandy soil because it's harder to get the, the water to kind of stay in that root zone. Now, the other issue is that sometimes it takes nutrients with it and the nutrients tend to run through that root zone as well. And now we look at clays, which are kind of the opposite, and they have extremely low permeability. And so when it does rain, you may see, you know, a quarter inch of that rainfall, if we get a one inch rainfall event that will infiltrate the soil, but then because it's kind of backed up, it gets backed up as it kind of percolates through. And so while it's waiting to infiltrate, it just runs off and water will always go with the path of least resistance so get, gravity takes it down sidewalks and driveways, down our storm drains, and that's why we tend to see more flooding problems because, you know, tend, tend to have saturated clay soils when it does rain, but also there's more pavement and driveways and parking lots and rooftops, less places for that water to go. So really the best soils or the ideas, ideal soils <clears throat> are those that have about 25% water and about 25% air. So when it's raining a lot, those, those air spaces are gonna be occupied by water. When it doesn't rain very often, those air spaces are not gonna have as much water in them. And so what we like is that balance where it's not too much water, it's not too little water, it's just the right amount of water for our plants to, to kind of take it through the root zone. Now, those mineral particles, the sand, silt, and clay we talked about, should make up about 45% of the perfect soil, which probably none of us have right now. And then about 5% should be organic matter. When we say organic matter, we don't mean certified organic. Basically, what we mean is just particles that were once living. So these are leaves or roots or different, you know, organisms, microbes, you know, fungi that have broken down. And that actually creates a product that's pretty stable. It's called humus, not, not hummus, uh, the same spelling. But uh, this is when we talk about sequestering carbon in the soil and all the benefits that that has. That's what it is. It's, it's organic material that has been broken down to its basic building block. Also in the soil are different roots. So you know, plant root zones grow in the soil, but they're actually a component of the soil and they affect soil in different ways, whether it's you know, just in season to season, maybe in a vegetable garden, but also long-term in kind of breaking down and, and as uh, soils evolve. And then those organisms we talked about, some of them are actually alive. So that fungi and bacteria and protozoa and nematodes, all these organisms live in the soil and they are a component of the soil and affect, you know, what plants we can grow, whether it's, you know, to their the detriment or to their benefit. Now, a quick soil test that everyone can try, it's kind of a fun project, especially if you have kids home from school, is the jar test. And basically you just take, maybe it's an old spaghetti sauce jar, ball jar, and you fill it about halfway full with a, a 
kind of a trowel full of a soil in your area of the landscape. You may actually want to take a few different samples, put them in a bucket. Maybe it's from this area under a tree, this area under the turf grass, this area in a flower bed, pull all the roots off, all the grass. You just want the soil and then fill that halfway in a jar and the other halfway, fill it up with water. And then you want to shake it. You want to just you know, shake, 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 shake as much as you can, you know, maybe for 10 minutes or so, and then set it on a, a counter and leave it for 24 hours. And what you'll see is those very small particles, the clay particles will settle out at the top the sand particles, the heaviest particles, will settle out at the bottom, and then those, those kind of middle particles, the silt, will settle out at the middle. And so if you look at this and you think, oh, sand is about 50% of that total, uh, maybe, you know, your, your silt is, is, you know, I don't know what that is, 35%, and then the clay makes up the end, then you can kind of estimate, oh, I have a, a, a sandy clay or sandy silt, um, and you know, really, whatever type of soil you have, it may vary from your neighbor's house to somebody across the Metroplex, but you can get a better estimate of, of what type of soil you have. Now, I'll estimate that most folks, if you do this, you will tend to come back with a clay. Other folks, however, may have a sandier soil, and then you can kind of plan and plant accordingly using that information. Now, I also mentioned soil pH, and I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into that because soil has a pH, depending on where you live, and that pH really plays a large role in what plants will grow uh, in a certain region. The ideal soil for plants is typically in that, that medium range, so kind of six to seven, maybe six to 7.5 in there, that's where majority of plants like to grow. Now, are there plants that will grow in a pH of five? Sure. Are there plants that will grow with a pH exceeding eight? Yes. But for the most part, if you want plants to be healthy, we're aiming for kind of a neutral pH in order to keep nutrients available and keep our plants happy. So we go too far to one side, to acidic soil, we create challenges to alkaline, we get another set of challenges. One of those is in nutrient availability. So we'll see here um, different nutrients. This we have at the top are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. These are the three nutrients that plants use in larger amounts, but we also have micronutrients in there as well. And you can look here kind of in the, the pH to six to seven, that's where most of the nutrients, the kind of the, the bar is the largest. And so they're available at, at, at that pH or that range right there. Now you'll notice that the availability of most of these nutrients is going to increase as the pH decreases a little bit as we go from kind of alkaline to acidic. The specific thing that I wanted to point out today is that iron and zinc are going to be deficient if the soils are too alkaline. And that's a problem that we have. Now our soils have plenty of iron in them, but the problem is because they're alkaline and have a high pH, uh, the soil wants to hold on to that iron. It's greedy with it and it won't release it to the plant root zone. So if you notice yellowing in between the veins of some of your plant leaves, that is a telltale sign that we actually have some type of iron deficiency. And so you may want to add compost, which typically has a lower pH than our soils, and that will allow more of that iron to be available. Or maybe you want to use something called chelated iron. It's just an iron that's more readily available to plants. You can use that as a soil drench or a foliar spray, um, but a common issue that we face here in, in North Texas. Now, that may be confusing. I know we went kind of fast there, a lot of information, but getting a routine soil test, test will point you in the right direction. So typically, we recommend that gardeners every two to three years, we do a test to test for those macronutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the, the, the nutrients that we're typically going to be on a bag of fertilizer. Our plants use those in larger amounts. Then every other time, so every four to six years, we probably want to get a test that includes micronutrients as well, like uh, the iron that we talked about. Um, you know, sometimes generally, you know, soil tests are about $20 for the basic test. Uh, maybe $30, $35 for the micronutrients. So it's really not too much of an investment. 
But if you get that back, they will send you recommendations on what nutrients you need to add and what amounts. Talk about you know the different uh, minerals that are available in your soil, um, other you know deficiencies, and so that will help you uh, know what nutrients you need to add, what uh, you know other soil amendments you need to add to have a healthy lawn, landscape, or or vegetable garden. Now the best way to do a soil test is to do what we call composite samples. Basically, that just means you want to dig a hole about seven or eight inches deep in different areas of your landscape, maybe up to three to 10 different areas. Again, we're removing all the vegetation, any leaves, any roots underneath. Uh, we just want the mineral kind of component of the soil, and then you'll mix that in a bucket, and then you're taking one sample from there. The reason that we take multiple samples and mix them together and just take a soil sample from there is because a lot of times this could be an area where maybe your dog uses the restroom or maybe it's another area where you planted a plant that took up a lot of nitrogen or maybe you were applying a bag of fertilizer and you kind of put a little bit too much in this area or not enough in this area. If you take a composite sample, it's kind of you're hedging your bets or you got kind of a homogenous estimate of the different nutrients and components of, of the soil you have. And then you just mix and ship that immediately to a soil testing lab. Now, there's a lot of different labs here locally and across the region. Just type in uh, DFW soil test and you can kind of search through and find. Uh, but again, most of the soil tests are going to be, uh, you know, less than $50 and you're doing that every two or three years. So, uh, so, so not too, too expensive. And in fact, if you get a recommendation back, you may actually be able to buy a cheaper bag of fertilizer. It's probably going to even out, um, you know, in terms of uh, financial savings. Now, one thing that every gardener probably is going to need to add to create healthy soil is compost. Compost improves soil quality and nutrition. It also is going to make you require less fertilizer over the long run. Now, we know that compost has plant nutrients, both those macro and micronutrients um, that plants use in different amounts, but they're not necessarily a fertilizer. Fertilizers apply quite a bit of nutrient where plants can take them up immediately, where compost has a smaller amounts of nutrients that as they break down, they're more readily available to plants. And there's a lot of other benefits to compost for sure, but one of the benefits is it's like fertilizer insurance. It's like you're not adding a whole lot, but you're adding enough in order to keep plants healthy for, for the growing season. Now, the other benefit of, of compost is it actually works like a sponge. Like the, the ability of a sponge to hold on to water, but also still have airspace and let the water run right through it is really kind of an interesting phenomenon. And that's how compost works in, in the soil, which is gonna help you save water and save money, especially during the summer months, but it also improves soil texture and aeration. So it's going to allow the clay soils to infiltrate water more quickly, but it's also going to lower the pH and to make those micronutrients like iron available to plants. So it's kind of a win-win. Now with sandy soils, it's going to prevent water loss. So the water just running right through those big sand pore spaces, but also it's going to keep the nutrients from running with that water and taking those nutrients with it. So and it creates an area where those nutrients can hang out in the soil and our plant roots can take advantage. Now, how are you actually going to, to incorporate the compost in your landscape? Well, if you have a new bed, you may want to add up to three inches of finished compost. Most places where you buy bulk compost on their website, they are going to have a calculator so you can actually calculate how much compost you need for an area in terms of yards, um, or tr truck load fulls is, is, is typically how they measure that. And then they'll actually ship it to your house. They deliver it to your house here locally. There's a number of companies. Just type in bulk compost. It tends to be about a third cheaper than buying it by the bag, you, you know, at a, a local nursery or a box store. And so something to consider there. And then you're going to dig or till up to the top six inches of soil. So, you know, maybe you already have plenty of organic matter. You might want to just top dress with 
an inch of compost and incorporate that into the top two inches of soil. Or maybe you want to apply two inches and incorporate that into the top four inches of soil, but up to three inches you can do. It's going to add organic matter as that organic matter breaks down. You'll see it kind of infiltrate into the lower soil profile layers and you'll get all those benefits that we talked about. Now there's another soil amendment that is inorganic that is just kind of a, a mineral product that you may also want to consider uh, adding, and that's called expanded shale. It's a, it's a product that is uh, produced here locally. You may have heard of geological formations, shale formations, but that's basically just crushed shale that has been heated up, and it's basically like little lava rock. So in our heavy clay soils, it's going to allow the water to infiltrate because it has those larger pore spaces, but it also has a unique ability to hold on to water during the drought periods. Now, the only knock on expanded shale, it's one of the best things we can add to our clay soils, but it tends to be a little bit more expensive. Compost is extremely cheap. In fact, you could and should be composting at home, uh, which stuff you'd normally throw away, you know, stuff you'd send uh, to the landfill, whether it's landscape waste or food scraps. So we teach classes uh, where we, 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 we talk about that in detail. But expanded shale is something that has to be incorporated into the soil to be effective. So you probably, if you are going to, to apply it, apply it in the high value areas and do it initially because unlike compost, you can't really just top dress on the top, which is the next way we can use uh, a compost in our turf areas. Now you may have turf areas that are compacted or maybe they're unlevel. And so in those areas, you can top dress up to a quarter inch of sifted compost. When we say sifted compost, it doesn't have big chunks of bark and wood in it. It's more fine, so we don't want big chunks of bark kind of covering up and, and shading our turf. Uh, you also may want to incorporate sand in there. Now, probably wouldn't plant, you know, apply sand just together, but mixing sand and compost together really have a nice combination that is going to help you level soil areas. But if maybe it's an area that is slow to drain, an area that you've seen a lot of foot traffic on, it can help those spaces reduce fungal problems and kind of dissipate that water a, a little bit better. Uh, you only want to apply about a quarter inch of a time, and then you use the back of a rake to kind of uh, work it in, and then you can let the, the turf grass grow up through it. And then in a few months, if you want to apply that again, in a few months you want to apply it again, that's great. But never, you never would want to put like an inch on your turf grass or you'd actually be more do, doing more harm than good. Now, uh, if you do have existing beds and you've got a lot of plant material, but you want to figure out how to incorporate compost, you can go ahead and top dress with about a half an inch of compost through the bed. Uh, just kind of rake it in. You can rake it in with the mulch that is already existing. And then you want to mulch on top of that. We recommend two to four inches of mulch around most of our landscape plants. So let's say you have an inch of mulch existing. You're going to you know, put a half an inch of compost on top of that. Well, then on top of that, you can put another you know, inch and a half or two inches of mulch, and that's going to be just fine. That compost will kind of work itself down into the soil. All the benefits we talked about, uh, your, your plants around there uh, will be able to take advantage of. Now, one of those is the, the uh, ability to hold moisture. As mulch breaks down, it is going to compost in place and help hold moisture. It's also going to prevent weeds. So if the mulch is blocking sunlight to the seed, then most of the seeds aren't actually going to germinate. Now, will some weeds pop up and blow in? Sure, but mulch can greatly reduce weed pressure, especially if you put it up to four inches around your plants. Um, that will really do a good job to kind of suffocate those weeds. It'll also regulate soil temperature. So if you have bare soil uh, around your landscape with just dirt, you may have temperatures that are, you know, 20 to 30 degrees hotter in the very top layer than if you bury them with mulch. And so that's benefit to the root zone around plants. It can also improve drainage. So one study showed that if you add an area that had four inches of mulch versus an area that was bare soil, 60% more rainfall or, or irrigation from an irrigation system will actually slowly infiltrate the soil. So that is a huge savings in terms of your water bill, but you're also reducing flooding at the same time uh, locally in, in your neighborhood. Now, the other benefit again is that mulch breaks down into 
nutrients. And so all those same benefits of compost will, will eventually uh, be there with the mulch. Now, there's a number of different mulch products out there. People always ask me what my favorite. Typically, I use hardwood mulch, uh, just a general hardwood mulch or cedar mulch in most of my landscape beds. And then if I'm using, uh, you know, mulch in vegetable gardens, I typically am going to use this the leaves that fall from the tree uh, or uh, pine straw to put around there. Both of those are kind of more light and airy. They break down quicker. And so uh, just for me, it works better in the vegetable garden. And then, you, you know, you can use uh, different, you know, any type of wood chip really underneath the sun. We want to make sure that on the back, it says it's a for forest product. I'd probably deter people from using mulch that is from chopped up pallets. Um, and definitely we want to discourage people from using rubber mulch. Let's, let's transition as, as we kind of are wrapping up, uh, you know, talking about nutrients to what is in a bag of fertilizer. So pretty much every bag of fertilizer, whether it's organic or synthetic, is going to have three numbers on it. And those three numbers are the percent of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So that first number is the 20 right there is going to be the percent of nitrogen in the bag. We see here that we have a zero phosphorus. And one of the reasons that we would recommend that is our soils tend to already have plenty of phosphorus in there. And they also tend to uh, hold that phosphorus longer than other soils. And so if you go through you know, uh, a season after you've already applied phosphorus, you're probably not going to need to apply a lot of phosphorus in you know, that same season. So it takes a while in order to need to apply phosphorus again many times. Now, getting a soil test is going to be more specific and help you there. Um, and, and then again, I said, you know, the, the third number is, is potassium. So really, bag of fertilizer, you know, it seems like it's kind of confusing. But if you read the instructions, you apply per label instructions, you use your soil test to tell you how many pounds of nitrogen you need to add, um, or what types of, of fertilizers are best for, for your application, then it, it's pretty simple. Um, I like to use slow release fertilizers. Uh, you may even want to uh, cut the rate in half and apply it kind of earlier in the season and then later in the season to make sure that you have nutrients that kind of last throughout. A lot of times people will use um, liquid fertilizers or synthetic fertilizers and they'll apply twice as much as the label says. And that creates more problems. So not only problems for the plant material, but also when they run off, that could create some problems too. So a lot of times people are, are looking at, at nutrient you know, products and in terms of fertilizers, and they'll see things that have fertilizers and herbicides together. We call those weed and feeds. Now, most of those are probably not gonna be the best for our area. And the reason that is, is typically fertilizers need to be applied when the grass is green or when the plants are green. And many herbicides that we call pre-emergence that are often incorporated in weed feeds, um, they are best applied when the turf grass is in its dormancy or before the weeds actually pop up. And so if you're applying fertilizer at the wrong time, or you're applying herbicides at the wrong time, then your plants aren't actually using those effectively. And so more of those have the potential to run off the landscape. So just something to keep in mind, you may wanna use fertilizers, you may wanna use herbicides, but probably best to use those as separate products, then there's really a small amount of time uh, that, you, that you could use those in, in the same bag type product. Now, we're also seeing, um, you know, three-in-ones or fertilizers that have insecticides in there. We also typically don't recommend those as well. And the reason that is, if you are applying a fire ant bait, you probably want to do that in an area that is having fire ant problems. So many of those baits you can put on the mound, but also you kind of distribute to the area adjacent to the fire ants. Well, if you only have fire ants, mounds in your backyard and you apply it to your front yard, you're implying an insecticide that that plant that that uh, you know those insects aren't actually using. So not only is that a little bit more expensive, but you know, where is that ending up down our creeks, down, you know, our, our storm drains into our lakes. Uh, and, and that's problematic. So um, not problematic to apply those products responsibly per the label instructions. 
but I wouldn't broadcast fertilizers and insecticides over the entirety of my landscape in, in the same product. Now, I mentioned problems with applying too much of a nutrient, and one of those is that excessive phosphorus, if we are applying, we have phosphorus in our soil and it tends to hang out in our soil a little bit longer, and let's say we apply too much uh, or in the wrong bag of fertilizer, it may actually reduce a micronutrient availability like that iron that we talked about, and, and, and it also costs more money if you're applying too much of, of a product. Also, if we apply too much nitrogen, a lot of people read the bag and say, oh, I'm going to apply more than this so my landscape will be twice as green. What tends to happen is you have excessive green growth, and this growth is lush, but it's weak, and it's more susceptible to disease and pest problems. We see this in greenhouses a lot, but also in landscapes. So make sure uh, that you're applying per label instructions. You're not overdoing it. Kind of hedge your bets with compost. Uh, but don't over apply those nutrients. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people do over apply nutrients, whether those are farmers and, and rural areas or, or folks here in the city that, that are meaning well, but they're over applying or misapplying nutrients. And what happens is those extra nutrients end up in our water resources. It creates algae growth or algal growth. And then it tends to kind of uh, create these barriers where sunlight can't go in. It uses up all the nutrients uh, that algae does. And then when the algae dies, then bacteria use up the oxygen that the fish would normally use. We call those you know, dead zones. You may have heard that um, in different parts of the Gulf of Mexico. And, and that becomes greater problems with the, the growing, rapidly growing populations, especially in urban areas where you know estimates uh, in Texas show that we could see an increase in 70% of our population by 2070 over the next 50 years, uh, 51 million people doing that, that could be problematic. In fact, we live in one of the most densely populated areas in the state. If you look at this map, each color represents a fourth of the population. So you'll notice like Houston is huge, right? And, and you know, West Texas has, has a large population and Central and East Texas has a large population, but kind of more spread out where we have a large port, port population in North Central Texas in a small area. And so that really means that we have to um, be very careful about what we do or we can kind of ebb and flow in, in one direction or the other. But 7.6 million people estimated now in our area. And, and again, that population is going to grow. And at the same time, uh, water demand that people need for you know, washing their hair or washing dishes or clothes or drinking water is also going to go up. Now, unfortunately, because of aging infrastructure, we have new lakes coming on and that's great you know, resources, but over time there's less water available simply because our lakes are holding less water and, and as we kind of slowly are increasing our infrastructure, that demand is growing at a higher rate. And so really the best way we can do to make sure that we preserve our water resources for the future is to conserve water with our landscape. Now, you know, a lot of people say we're telling them don't use water. No, we, we definitely should water during those drought periods and water at the time in order to keep our plants alive and healthy. But when we apply water, we wanna make sure that we're using, uh, you know, drip irrigation or multi-stream rotors, or, you know, we're watering earlier in the morning, we're, we're not watering on windy days and we're watering that it's actually going into the root zone rather than running off of our landscape. In fact, if we look at outdoor water use in, in per gallons a day per household, you can see that in our area, we have a really high demand. Now, there is also higher demand in kind of the Northwest Texas and kind of the Amarillo area, but they get significantly less rainfall. And you might be surprised that the other urban populations like around Houston, um, they actually get more rainfall. And so North Central Texas, we really have a higher demand right now probably than we should. And we need to be more efficient with the water in our landscape. In fact, a lot of times, some estimates show that homeowners tend to water landscape as much as two to three times the amount that is actually needed. 
But my colleague Patrick Dickinson is back with tips on what you can do to save water in your landscape and perhaps even lower your water bill this summer. All right, so let's talk some irrigation. One of the things that people, when they come to North Texas, um, struggle with is our soil. Our soil is a really heavy clay soil. Uh, it doesn't allow a lot of water in, and sometimes it doesn't allow a lot of water out. So that's where we get a lot of runoff when it comes to irrigation. So one of the things that I really want you to remember is that we have to introduce water very slowly to our soil. Um, I'm out here right now. Many of y'all probably are going to be buying some plants and putting it in your garden and your landscape. And, and I make sure that I spot water those plants. I'm not going out there and just turning on that irrigation zone because that saves a lot of money. Um, and a lot of water for all of us. But introducing water very slowly, this is where drip irrigation is a huge asset in your landscape um, because it puts water out in gallons per hour, where spray puts water out very quickly, gallons per minute. Um, and it's just, that's where it runs right off of our clay soil, especially when our clay soil is dry and cracked. Um, and that's where, um, when we introduce, think of it like a dry sponge, you know, dampening that sponge to get to soak up some of that water. Um, that's really what we want to do with irrigation on our clay soil introducing water very slowly, drip irrigation, and doing cycle and soak, running multiple programs on your irrigation controller. And if you don't have a controller that allows you to run multiple programs, programs A, B, C, and D, which means you can set up customized programs for each one, you have multiple run times, then it's time for a new controller. If you don't have a controller that allows you to have a rain and freeze sensor, it's time for a new controller. Those are two things you have to have. Um, with the irrigation controller. Uh, the if rain and freeze sensor is required by the state. It avoids things by turning off your irrigation system at about 38 degrees um, or about three eighths of an inch of rainfall. You know, another great thing that we have on our website that will make you more successful when it comes to um, irrigating your landscape is a soil moisture meter. If you don't have a soil moisture meter, we have them on our website because they can be kind of tricky to find from time to time. Um, watering some pots as I do this and using my watering can instead of my irrigation system. Um, you know, doing a rain and freeze sensor tells you if there's moisture in the soil and if you even really need to irrigate um, your landscape. Um, and that can save, again, a lot of water and a lot of money for yourself. So um, check that soil moisture mirror. You can use it on your pots, you can use it in your, your lawn, your flower bed, your vegetable garden, um, but it's a great tool to have in your tool belt. So don't lose it. Um, don't leave it in the soil. Um, it will deteriorate. It's meant to be probed into the soil and taken out um, and kept with your uh, gardening toolkit overall. So potted plants. Now potted plants, we do have to supplement a lot more water uh, during the summertime um, because they dry out quicker, especially when we look at a lot of our terracotta pots that breathe really well. They dry out a lot faster. So introducing water, sometimes when it's the heat of the summer, like right now we're still heating heat and heat and heat indexes that are uh, you know, almost 100 degrees. Um, ceramic uh, glazed pottery, like you see right here, it doesn't breathe as much, so it holds water a little bit more. Uh, plastic containers, if you have plastic pots, you also probably know that they also hold a lot of water. Um, and metal pots hold a lot of water and a lot of heat in our landscape. So that's where taking that watering can, even taking your watering can off the rain barrel, which um, we'll talk about as well, um, with the rainwater harvesting. Rain barrels are a great way to fill up watering cans, short water hoses for vegetable gardens, um, things of that nature. Um, but with irrigation, we have to always re remember what it does is supplement the lack of rainfall. So keep that in mind when you're uh, getting into the gardening. Um, and also one of the other irrigation tricks that I like to tell people is more about the hand watering. Um, when you plant a brand new plant, I like to kind of flood the hole initially. Um, meaning what after I planted it, digging the hole twice as wide, fill that hole back up. I'll take my water hose and I'll soak that hole and flood it basically. Um, and when I do that, that kind of collapses all the soil around that uh, root ball of that plant. This is one of the newer plants here and it's doing great in the heat um, by, you know, saturating and getting that moisture into that root ball that the plant really needs. And that's what irrigation is all about, is putting water where it needs to go, which is at the roots of the plant, not on the leaves of the plant. Having water sit on the leaves of your plants, especially all night long, invites disease and insect. 
That's why the number two thing with irrigation, we know number one is overwatering. The number two is not irrigating at the right time of day. Early morning is the best time of day to irrigate your landscape. Um, that's when plants are really sucking up that moisture and those nutrients in preparation for the day. And it also, not leaving the water on the leaves of those plants all night long, um, keeps things dry at night. Whereas it's water sitting on leaves and things all night long, we get fungal problems that way. So late at, late at night watering, you can do with drip irrigation because we're putting the water at the roots of the plant versus at the leaves of the plant. And it's also usually exempt from days of watering, uh, what days we're allowed to water um, our landscape, um, because, but it's still, we don't want you to water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, the reason for that is that's when our evapotranspiration at, is at its highest. We have more water going up um, than we can put down. And so we don't want to be irrigating during those hours. Uh, you'll be losing a lot of the water. Sometimes half the water you're putting out during those hours. So try to avoid that 10, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. time frame. Um, there is a scientific reason as to why we avoid those. Um, and so when you're looking again and you're learning about your irrigation, and some of y'all may not have a sprinkler system, you use the same principles. Uh, if you're running um, uh, irrigation in your flower beds and you don't have an automatic sprinkler system, meaning like those old sprinklers, going back and forth. Best time of day to water is early morning. Set that sprinkler up to water when you get up to work from home if you do that. Um, but we also have drip classes where we teach you how to put drip permanently in your flower beds even if you don't have a sprinkler system and run a water hose and you can manually run those when you need those to run. So just remember don't be an overwaterer have that rain and freeze sensor and a controller that uh, will allow you to have one and a controller that has multiple programs so you can cycle through your irrigation system. Introduce water slowly to our clay soil um, and you will be more successful and you'll have less runoff. Good luck to you. Now that is great information, Patrick. And doesn't he, he have a, a beautiful landscape? Now one thing that Patrick mentioned that I wanted to hit home again is twice a week watering. Now, wherever you're tuning in from throughout the metro, like 90% of cities actually have watering restrictions or guidelines that allow us to water twice a week. Now, the good news is that even during droughts and summers, most of our plant material is perfectly fine with twice a week watering. Um, in fact, we should only focus on planting plants uh, that we have to water twice a week or less. Now, this is just some guidelines from one city, but depending on your city, if you want to know what day is your watering day, you can do a quick search on your city's website to make sure that you're not violating those watering guidelines. You're watering on the right days. You're watering uh, either before 10 o'clock in the morning, which is best, or after uh, you know 6 p.m. in the evening once things start to cool down. So not only are you more effectively delivering the water to your plant root zones, but you're also doing your part as a steward in our community. Now, if you have any questions, Patrick and I would love to address those in the comment section now. Again, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. We also want to, again, thank our sponsors, the folks at Water is Awesome. Uh, remember, their website is waterisawesome.com. And if you want to check out the resources at Rooted In or get a hold of Patrick and I, our website is rootedin.com. And you can connect with both Water is Awesome or Rooted In on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, or YouTube. And we would love to continue this relationship throughout the seasons to come.